The Ear and Other Senses Structure and Function Lecture The objectives of this lecture are to discuss the anatomy of the ear and the sensory function in the hearing and equilibrium, name and describe the major forms of hearing impairment, and discuss the chemical receptors and their functions. The ear, the sense organ of hearing, and also the equilibrium and is also responsible for equilibrium and balance. There are three main divisions of the ear. There is the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The middle ear and the inner ear are hidden deep within the temporal bone. The external ear, the external ear consists of the auricle or the pina. We often refer to this as the pina, as the appendage on the side of the head is the cartilage part of the ear that we see. It is a curving tube 2.5 centimeters or about one inch in length and contains ceruminous glands and the external ear ends at the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is also known as the eardrum. You can see here this is a picture of the pina that has been affected by what's called cauliflower ear, which can be due to blunt trauma. Examination of the ear. So in A, we have the outside of the ear. We have the helix, which is the top part, then the triangular fossa, which is the inner part of the top. We have the contra, the medius, the tragus, the antitragus and the lobe of the ear. B, you see a practitioner using an otoscope to look into the inside of the ear. And when we use an otoscope, we will see the tympanic membrane, which is seen here in C. The tympanic membrane, under normal circumstances, is a pearl gray color. And we can oftentimes see the malleus which is in the inner ear, or the middle ear, I should say, which can sometimes be seen through the tympanic membrane. And as you can see here, you can see the hand of the malleus. So here's a picture of an ear on the left-hand side, and this picture is showing where we have some cerumen buildup in the ear canal of the outer ear. Cerumen can build up. It's a waxy form. It can be yellow, gray, black, brown, greenish tinge depending on the particles that may collect within the ceruminous earwax. The earwax can just line the outer edges of the ear canal or it can totally block off the ear canal which can cause hearing impairment. On the right hand side is what you would see when you're looking into the ear with an otoscope and as you can see on the outer edges we have some cerumen buildup and these little fibers here are ear hairs. The middle ear is an epithelium lined cavity that houses the ear ossicles. These ossicles consist of the malus, inches, and stapes. You will want to know these three for your exam. It ends in the oval window and the auditory or eustachian tube connects with the middle ear to the throat, which sometimes if there's an infection of some sort, fluid can connect with the middle ear via this tube. Inflammation is called otitis media when there's a fluid buildup that becomes infected. Sound waves pass through the tympanic membrane of the outer ear to the malleus, then through the inca, incus, and then to the stapes, and then onto the oval window. The inner ear consists of the bony labyrinth filled with perilymph is subdivided into the vestibule, semicircular canals, and cochlea. The membranous labyrinth is filled with endolymph. The receptors for balance are in the semicircular canals and they're called the cristae ampullaris. 
sensory hair cells on the organ of cordi, which is also known as the organ of hearing, which is the spiral type organ in the inner ear, responds when bent by movement of surrounding endolymph set in motion by sound waves. And those sound waves are those same sound waves passing through the tympanic membrane, the ossicles of the ear, and through the oval window. So here's a picture of the inner, inner ear, and the orange part is the bony labyrinth and is a hard outer wall of the entire inner ear and includes the semicircular canals, the vestibula, and the cochlea, as you can see here. Within the bony labyrinth is the labyrinth, which is the purple part, which is here where my arrow is, which is surrounded by perilymph and filled with endolymph. Each ampulla in the vestibule contains a crista ampullaris that detects changes in the head position and sends sensory impulses through the vestibular nerve to the brain. So you see here the vestibular nerve going on to the eighth cranial nerve and on into the brain. B shows a section of the membranous cochlea and the hair cells, which are pointing here, these blue little hair cells, in the organ of cordi or the spiral organ, which detects sound and sends the info through the cochlear nerve. So the organ of cordi is this whole entire unit and it sends little messages to the nerve as pointed here, as you can see here, and sends info through the cochlear nerve. The vestibular and cochlear nerves join to form the eighth cranial nerve. Effects of sound waves on the cochlear structures, so they're to review again, you will have a sound wave that strikes the eardrum or the tympanic membrane, which is here. It will then cause a vibration. The vibration causes the membrane to vibrate the oval window, which is right here, just beyond the malleus, inches, and stapes. You have the oval window, which causes a vibration in the oval window. The vibration of the oval window causes the perilymph in the bony labyrinth of the cochlea to move, which causes the endolymph in the membranous labyrinth of the cochlea to, or the cochlea duct to move. So the cochlea duct then moves. This movement stimulates hair cells on the organ of cordae to generate a nerve impulse which travels and becomes part of the eighth cranial nerve. Nerve impulses reach the auditory cortex of the brain and then are interpreted there. The taste receptors, another name for, so receptors are chemoreceptors. Another name for chemoreceptors are gustatory, gustatory cells and are also called taste buds. The papillae of the tongue structures contain the taste buds, and most taste buds are located in the back of the tongue. The cranial, the seventh cranial nerve and the ninth carry the gustatory impulses. There are only four kinds of taste sensations. They're sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. The gustatory and olfactory senses work together in our taste. So here's a picture of the dorsal surface of a tongue in A. And as you can see the papillae here, we have a lot more papillae towards the back of our tongue. We also have, you can see the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils here. B is a section through the papillae which taste buds uh, are on the sides. So we, you can see the papillae here and then the taste buds on the side. And then in C is an enlarged view of what a taste bud looks like. So we have our taste pore 
and our, then our optic nerves on the other end receiving the message of what kind of taste we are getting. The smell receptors. So receptors of fibers of the olfactory or the first cranial nerve lie in the olfactory mucosa of the nasal cavity. Cumo receptors located in the, are located in the epithelial tissue in the upper part of the nasal cavity. Olfactory receptors are extremely sensitive but are fatigued, but are easily fatigued. That's why when we are smelling a perfume, we can smell it at first, and then the more we try and sniff and smell it, the smell gets burnt out and we can't smell it anymore. Odor-causing chemicals initiate a nerve signal that is interpreted as a specific odor by the brain. In order to detect odor, chemicals must dissolve into the watery mucus of the lining of the nasal cavity. Olfactory structures. So gas molecules stimulate the olfactory cells in the nasal epithelium. Sensory information is conducted along nerves in the olfactory bulb and the olfactory tract in the sensory process centers of the brain, which you can see here the thalamic center of the brain.